Hey, it looks like we're actually online. Cool. All right. <laughs> it's a blessing to be in the Lord's house tonight. Thank you all for being here, for singing, and um, appreciate it, you guys. And uh, uh, you got your Bible turned to John chapter number 10. Um, but, but I also ask you to have your hymnal open to page 389. And page 389 is a song called Bring Them In. Amen. And we know how the song goes, you probably remember it. Bring them in, go out and bring them in. Bring them in from the fields of sin. There's three verses to this song that I want to look at tonight and examine it. We're also going to be looking at scriptures when I talk about it. But the song emphasized, this song uh, specifically, is ma many times in churches all across, and for all of my life, uh, this has been a song that's sung pr primarily at harvest time. Uh... In the fall, the end of summer, going into fall, uh, especially at, at uh, missions conferences, people at missions conferences or evangelistic soul winning conferences, things like that. This is a song that's always, always brought uh, brought forward and sang, um, and it's a good one, amen. Um, because it's talking about the importance of helping the shepherd to find the lost sheep, to seek the lost sheep, and so um, I want to look at verse number one of, of uh, bring them in. Look what the Bible says. It says, hark. Hark being a word that's trying to call your attention to something. Amen? It's saying, listen up, people. Hark. Hearken unto me, as sometimes the Bible says. He says, hark. So immediately, he wants your attention. He's like, look up here, look up here. Hark. Then he says, tis the shepherd's, that's capital S, shepherd. Amen? Tis the shepherd's voice I hear. Out in the desert, dark and drear. Calling the sheep. Who've gone astray, far from the shepherd's fold, away. And so, immediately, he's talking about something. We're going to look at just three simple points tonight about the shepherd. Because it does talk about the shepherd here. The first thing we mentioned is the shepherd here. And so, uh, if you're taking notes tonight, number one, I want you to write down the shepherd's purpose. The shepherd's purpose is given us in this stanza in the very, very first verse um, heart is the shepherd's voice I hear out in the desert, dark and drear. What is his purpose? He's calling the sheep who've gone astray far from the shepherd's fold away. So, if you look at John chapter number 10, John chapter number 10, and uh, look at there in verse number um, 11, we understand and, and we'll see what, who the Bible says the shepherd is. Amen? So in John chapter 10, in verse number 11, the Bible says, uh, I, and this is the, if you have a red letter edition Bible, it's going to have your red words of Christ are in red. And he says, I am the good shepherd. Amen. And then he goes on to tell us about himself. He says, the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is in hireling and not the shepherd, whose own sheep are not, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming, and leaveth the sheep and fleeth. And the wolf catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth because he is an hireling. And he careth not for the sheep. Verse 14, I am the good shepherd. And I and know my sheep and am known of mine. Amen. So Jesus is explaining to us immediately uh, in, our, in our passage here. He is the shepherd. He's not going to leave us nor forsake us. Tells us that all through the Bible. He's going to be there. He wants to be there for us. He loves us. He knows everything there is to know about us. And He wants us to follow Him. Amen. The Bible gives a, 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 another example here of a hireling. Someone who is just hired to, watch, uh, to uh, keep an eye on the sheep. Amen. Just a hireling to watch the sheep. Now, He is not the shepherd. The sh uh, he is just there to keep an eye on them. And the Bible says that as soon as a wolf shows up, the hireling just bolts. <laughs> he takes off. He's like, all right. Get to see a sheep, I'm out of here. I'm not going to deal with no wolf. And he just leaves. And the Bible says he takes off. And the Bible says, well, he leaves because he's not invested in, uh, in what he's doing. He's not invested in the sheep. He's just there as a hired. He's just been hired, just a hired hand. And he, I don't know if he just decides, hey, a wolf's not worth my pay or whatever. He's like, not paying me enough to deal with a wolf. I'm just leaving. But anyway, the Bible says the hireling leaves because he's in hireling. But the, he goes on to say, the good shepherd, he will be there. Um, he says he doesn't care for the sh the hireling doesn't care for the sheep like the shepherd does. The shepherd cares for his sheep. He says, "I am the good shepherd." In verse fourteen, which he's repeating, verse eleven, 
And he says, and I know my sheep and have known of mine. So we know the shepherd is the Lord Jesus Christ, who loves his people, loves us uh, uh, with an everlasting love. Praise God for that. Amen. And uh, uh, so the Bible says in, uh, in Matthew chapter 18, you don't need to turn there, but you know the, the, the scripture. He goes out into the desert to find that, sh that one sheep that's gone astray. Amen. He'll leave the 90 and 9 to go find the one. He cares for the one that's wandered off. And the Bible says he'll go off into the desert, into the wilderness, to go and find the one sheep that has gone. And when he had found it, he brings it back. And he's rejoicing in the fact that he found, brought, brings that sheep back into the fold. Amen. And so that's the shepherd's purpose. He's looking to bring people into the fold. And the reason why he needs to find them is, is, is many times they've gone astray. Now, um... There's a lot of people that you've probably known over the years, people that I've known over the years, that have got Kendo Church. And uh, I, I read something earlier today, I saw a preacher friend of mine posted, he said, if, if a new convert doesn't, come, doesn't have culture shock when they come to your church, something's wrong. Amen? In other words, we're to be a peculiar people. We're not to be like the world. We're to be totally, completely different. So someone who is just newly saved and comes in and just like doesn't understand what's going on, doesn't even know how to read a hymnal, doesn't know how to find Bible verses, it's like total culture shock for them. Praise God for that, amen? We're to, we're to help them, we're to nurture them, we're to love them, and we're to bring them along on their journey uh, towards the cross and, and towards the Lord and towards heaven, and this is what we're supposed to do. Uh, but I tell you, there's been many, many times over the years that I have seen people come into the church and hear the gospel for the first time and realize their need for a Savior. Maybe they didn't get saved right away. Maybe they came several times to several services. Maybe even years. And then I've also known people that have come the very first time they showed up at church, they got saved. But whether they just got saved or whether they came for a long time and then got saved or what have you, as soon as they get saved, I've seen it so many times that they go astray. They're following God and they're, 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 they're doing what... Uh, they're coming to church, but then the devil gets a hold of them. That wolf comes in and starts to pull them away. And it's true that we've seen people that have, even in this church, that have that once sat in these chairs and sat in these pews and, and, and heard the word of God that no longer come anymore. And that we don't know where they are. Some of them might not be in church. I can, there's countless people that I can name and think of, even right now, that I went to Bible college with, that I went to church with, and all the churches that I've served in over the years that I've seen them, that I thought were faithful, and that even, even people that helped me in my journey, that have fallen away, that have fallen astray. And you know, uh, the Bible says that the shepherd still cares for them, and he still wants them to come home. He wants them to come back and be in the fold, and praise God for that. The shepherd's purpose is, is, is to love us and to help his sheep, but he's, his shepherd is also, the Bible said he's also come to seek and to save that which is lost. He wants us, he, his, his purpose is to see people come to know uh, Him as their Lord and personal Savior. The reason He came down to this earth, gave His life on the cross for us so that uh, He could uh, offer us eternal life. Amen? The Bible says He died on the cross, and um, he, when He rose again on the third day, He brought with Him the keys to death and hell. He's conquered both death and hell, and He has the keys to eternity, so He, can, he is the only one that can give us eternal life in heaven. There's all kinds of religions across this entire world. Islam and Buddhism and Taoism and all this, all this other kinds of things out there. But there's only one Christ. And that's the only, and he's the truth. He's the right one. Amen. He's the only one that can offer eternal life. Uh, Buddha can't do it. Uh, Muhammad uh, can't do it. Amen. The prophets of those religions passed away and died and stayed dead. As a matter of fact, I know there's a, there's like I think there's a picture or, or a there's a there's a, a finger or something like a mummified finger of one of the prophets Buddha or something like that that travels around the Asian a lot of Asian countries and people will go for miles to they have a little glass box right there and they'll go to worship this decrepit mummified finger of the prophet that had once passed away. They're putting all their 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 belief in something that's just fleshly and temporal and not now Christ, the thing is. We don't have a, a, a dead finger or, a, or, or any kind of thing like that from our Lord because our Lord isn't dead. Amen. Amen. Our Lord rose again on that third day, the Bible says, and He is actually right now at the right hand of God in heaven, 
And he is alive today. Praise God for that. And so, his, and his purpose in coming down here originally was so that he could see people saved. That he could, and now also for the lost sheep that he could bring them in. And, and, and so our purpose needs to match up with his. Are you praying and asking God to bring people into your life that you could share the gospel with them? Are you praying for God to bring people to Solid Rock Baptist Tabernacle so that they can hear the gospel and get saved and know where they're going uh, for their eternity? Amen? Are you praying for that? Are we looking for that? Because that's our purpose. That's the reason that the church exists. So that we can propagate the gospel and get it out there. If we're not doing that, then what are we doing? If a church isn't getting the gospel out, the church isn't preaching the gospel every chance it gets, and, and, and sharing the gospel with the lost out there, then what all, all the church is is just a social club. It's just a club where people come and sit together and have a meal, and we're not really here for any greater purpose other than just to hang out with each other. That's the same thing people do at the country club, the same people they do at dinner clubs, the same people they do at Elks clubs, and all these other kind of clubs out there. We're to be wholly different because we have a divine purpose, and that's to tell people about the gospel of Jesus Christ. We tell them that Jesus loves them. Tell them that there's a shepherd that wants to bless their lives. Amen. The shepherd's purpose in this very first verse of uh, bring them in, he says, "Hark, tis the shepherd's voice that I hear, out in the desert, dark and drear, and he's calling the sheep who've gone astray, far from the shepherd, fold away." Now go on to verse number two. Look at verse number two of this of this song. It says this. This is what I call the shepherd's press. The shepherd's press. Because he is pressing upon us what, we're, what he wants us to do. Look what it says in verse number 2. He says, who go and who? Now he's, now he's bringing it down to you and me. Amen. Mm -hmm. He's bringing it down personal. He says, okay, who? Who go and help this shepherd kind? Who's going to help the shepherd? Who's going to stand up and say, Lord, I will be the one to go. I will be the one to tell people about what you did for them. The Bible says, who go and, or, I'm sorry, the song says, who go and help this shepherd kind? Help him, the wandering ones to find. Who, and then look at this verse. Who will bring the lost ones to the fold? Where they'll be sheltered from the cold. Who? Who's it going to be? We have churches full of people all across this country. I talked to friends and pastor... Uh, um, AJ, we have friends that we have pastor friends all across the country we talk to all the time. And I'll tell you, uh, uh, the, uh, the last three or four pastors that I've talked to across the country, you know what they're dealing with? The biggest thing they're dealing with in their in their churches, uh, just in passing. You know, I, I I never bring it up. I was like, what's going on in your church or anything? We just start talking, and they'll ask me to, hey, please please pray for my church. You know what they're dealing with? Apathy. They're dealing with apathetic believers. They're people that just show up at church. They sit there, they don't want to get involved, they don't want to do anything for the church, they don't want to do anything to help, they won't show up for work days, they won't come to prayer meeting on a midweek service, they're just showing up and filling a spot in a pew or in a chair on a Sunday and then leaving, and that's all they're doing, and that, there's something wrong with that. There's something wrong with that. There's another pastor that posted something just this morning I saw uh, on Facebook, uh, uh, Brother, uh, I think it was Brother Kenny, um, that posted something about... Uh, what, what a Christian will, will, will go through in their lifetime. When you get saved and you start going to church and you, you start uh, learning about the Bible. I remember when I first started going to church, the very first thing that I, didn't, that I had to learn and I didn't quite understand was that I needed to, somebody to tell me how to read a hymnal. Because all my life I had read, uh, when I read, I just read sentence after sentence after sentence. Hymnals are not written that way, Amen. When I first picked up the hymnal, first time I came into church, I was 13 years old. I, got, I had just gotten saved, and I was just learning some things, and I was confused as all get out when I came into church. I'm just a teenager, and I'm looking at this verse, and say, say we would take this verse, and I would, and I would be singing. I love to sing. I, I like to sing. I was just learning to sing back then. I was 13. I was just learning to sing. And, and, uh, but I'm singing along with them. Heart is the shepherd's voice I hear Out in the dark desert, dark and drear who go and help this shepherd? And I'm like, I will go right to the next verse. And everybody else is singing something totally different. And I'm like, wait, wait. And I'm looking around. I was confused. Thankfully, there was a young girl in the youth group. Her name is Katrina Durham, who was part of my youth group. And she, I credit her with helping me to stay plugged into the church. And uh, also, uh, you know, she was, she was great. I love Katrina. Now, here's the thing. She looked and she saw that I was confused. And so she kind of leaned over and she pointed to where we were going and she showed me that the stanzas, because I had never, I, 
I was just learning to read music and I didn't really, I, I was reading one line of, of clarinet music, but I didn't know how to read full stanzas and staffs and all that kind of stuff. So she showed me where we were going in the hymnal. And I was like, oh, I get it now. It took, but I had to have somebody explain that to me. You know, that was one of those things. Um, when people come into church, there's things they've got to learn. They don't know, amen? They're learning for the first time. Uh, Brother Kenny uh, Canterbury posted something this morning. He said, the average Christian, and let's listen to this, the average Christian in attending church, okay, attending church through your lifetime, will sing over 500 songs and hymns and, and, and in one year, okay? In one year, you'll sing over 500 songs and hymns. You'll listen to over 200 Bible messages every single year. If you're faithful to church, Sunday morning or Sunday and, and midweek services, and then also you have the revivals and missions conferences and all these kinds of things, different conferences yeah. you'll go to. You hear all kinds of preaching and all kinds of messages. So on average, 500 songs, 200 messages, sometimes more, sometimes more songs. Uh, we sing more songs than any other church that I've been to, and I love it. Uh, but we, there's all, I've also, I listen to more, I, I know I listen to more than 200 Bible messages a year. Because I listen to podcasts, I listen to other churches, I listen to all kinds of different preaching from other places. I love it. Um, but uh, on average, 500 songs a year, 200 Bible messages a year, and does not share the gospel with one person. This is the average Christian that attends church for one year, will come to a church and will sing 500 songs, and will hear 200 Bible messages and not share the gospel one time. Now, praise God, I, I, you know, that our church is... Every single Sunday, I have an opportunity to go out. And out through the week, Pastor asked us last Sunday to grab some uh, tracks and take them with you. Hand out five tracks this week and give them out and, and hand them to people. And, and do, your, do what you can to share the gospel. Praise God for that. Amen. We should be doing that. We should be taking the gospel. You should be sharing the gospel. We should be giving, giving out tracks everywhere you go. we got boxes of tracks that we still need to get rid of. Wouldn't it be great by the end of the year? We're completely out of tracks because we just gave God rid of them. We put them out everywhere. Pastor Quinn, my former pastor, who's now with the Lord, back in Aztec, he used to say this to us in our church. He said, he said, I am all for being decent and orderly. And he was. He was. He was very decent and orderly. He, was, he, was, uh, he, he wanted things to have planning. He wanted things to be uh, done decently in order. He was very good about it. He said, when it comes to tracks, I want you guys to be sloppy with them. That's what he would tell us. He said, I want you to take those tracks. You, you drop them everywhere. Put them out at, everywhere. You go to visit a hospital, put them on the, on the chairs in, in the waiting room. You go to a doctor's office, put them in the chairs in the waiting room. Put them in the, put them in the, in the, in the magazine rack when you're standing at the grocery store on your way out. Put them everywhere. He said, we'll, we'll order more tracks. Be sloppy with them. That's what he told us. And then go out and, and get the gospel out. Give an and it's so, it's so worrisome that... This post that I saw from Brother Kenny is, is actually Brother Bill Marshall. I don't know Brother Marshall, great, great preacher too, um, who actually said it first, but or he's the one that posted it. I don't know if he said it, but he's the one that posted it. But it's so sad that across our whole nation, we have churches filled with, with Christians, 500 songs a year, 200 Bible messages a year, and not share the gospel one time. We hear it. We know it. We have the cure for the sin sickness of those around us and in our community, and in our family, and we don't share it, there's something wrong. We need to get a hold of the shepherd's purpose, and we need to see the shepherd's press. Amen? The shepherd's press. He says, who, who, who go and help? The shepherd. Kind. Who, help him, who will help him? The wandering ones to find. Who will bring the lost ones to the fold so they'll be sheltered from the cold? Turn with me over there to Matthew chapter number 9. Matthew chapter number 9. Look with me there in verse number 36. Matthew chapter 9, verse 36. As Christ is coming along with his disciples here, look what it says in verse number 36. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them, because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep, having no shepherd. Look what he goes on to say. Then he saith, saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers, the laborers are few. 
Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that He will send forth laborers into His harvest. Amen. We need more people to be laborers. To, if you have an opportunity, you see an opportunity, you share the gospel, you just hand a track. It's not that hard. You just hand a track. The gospel is right there in all of our tracks. It's simple and easy to read and people will take it and read it. But even if they don't, if you gave them the track, you've done your part, now get, it's in, they, it, the ball's in their court and God can... Do whatever. I know pastors who pastor churches today that were saved because somebody just handed them a track. Nobody actually witnessed to them, but they read a track and realized they needed that and they got saved. Because of a track, somebody left them. So, it's, there's nothing wrong with doing that. The shepherd's press is he wants us, he's pressing, he's constraining us. Another word for press is constraining. Uh, he's constraining us. For the need. He, uh, he's, he's wanting us to go and, and do this. Who's going to help the shepherd in this church? Who's going to go and help the, uh, 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 find the lost ones and bring them back? Who's going to go and, and bring them into the fold? Amen. Who's going to do that? We help the shepherd find the wandering ones uh, uh, by preaching the gospel. We preach the gospel, and Pastor uh, AJ preaches every single uh, uh, Sunday morning, or Sunday and, and Thursday night. And, uh, of course, he'll be preaching all next week uh, over in, at Unity Baptist Church in Maine. Please be in prayer for that. Look with me over in the book of Acts real quick. In the book of Acts and chapter number 8. The book of Acts, chapter number 8. Flip there real quick. Amen. The shepherd, we, we help the shepherd find the wandering ones by preaching the gospel. Acts chapter number 8, verse number 4. Look what happened here. Therefore they that were scattered abroad. Now, what happened is Saul came along. He created, created havoc in the church in verse number 3. Entering every house and hailing men and women, committing them to prison. And so he was going after the Christians. This is before he became Paul. Amen. He was still Saul. But um, the Bible says because that was going on, because the persecution was happening in those, in those cities, what happened? They were scattered abroad. They, the, the, the believers were scattered abroad, but this is what they did. They went everywhere preaching the word. It didn't stop them from preaching the word just because they were being persecuted. Yeah, they were maybe driven out of their houses. Yeah, maybe they were driven out of their churches because they were being persecuted. But the Bible says that they went everywhere preaching the word. It didn't, it didn't uh, stop them from going and telling. They went to all the cities. They went all over the... The area, every place that they ended up, they preached the word of God. They told people about the Lord Jesus Christ. They told them about uh, the salvation that can be found through Jesus and his sacrifice on the cross for them. Amen. Amen. So that's a good thing. And praise God for that. The fold, uh, the Bible says, you know, he says, bring the lost ones to the fold. Uh, the fold is the church of our Lord. Uh, 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 this uh, Bible, uh, Solid Rock, uh, sorry. I almost said Bible Baptist. Solid Rock Baptist Tabernacle is our fold. Amen. And that's where we bring our lost sheep. That's where we bring them. We bring them here. Praise the Lord. Miss Gina has been bringing a couple people. We we're hoping that another one would come tonight. Praise God. We've all uh, had people show up here bringing the church. That's a good thing. Don't stop. Keep working at it. Keep coming out. Keep inviting them. Keep trying to get them here. Amen. Uh, because it's a good thing. We want to bring the lost ones to the fold. That's the shepherd's press. He's constraining us. He's looking for people in his churches, for his believers, those who claim to be his followers and, and love him, to, to come alongside him and say, Lord, I will be whatever you I need to tell people about Christ. I want to be the one that show them or show them the way to you. Now we can't save them, of course we can't. The Lord does the sa the saving, amen. I remember I had some young teen teens uh, in my youth group years ago and I've been preaching with them. I had a Wednesday night teen class with the kids. Every Wednesday night we we opened up, we, we, we'd, uh, we'd uh, go into class and we, uh, we'd sing some songs and I'd play a couple of goofy games with them and uh, always got them excited. And then I, we'd preach the gospel. And I remember one Wednesday night, uh, I don't know what it was, but it was one Wednesday night we had four kids. At, at the, I, I was preaching, I preached another message. Uh, it was actually, wasn't actually really a, a gospel message. And I preached really hard the gospel the Sunday before. But on Wednesday night, um, I, I alluded to the message and I talked about the gospel. But I was teaching on something else that night. Uh, we were working on, we, oh, we were talking about the blood, and, but I was working on, uh, on uh, being a follower of Christ. And at the end of that service, at the end of that night, I had four kids that come forward to me, and a couple of a uh, couple of uh, workers came up and they took a couple over here off to the. Well, my my one worker I had took a couple, and I took two. 
Uh, there were four girls. And um, they wanted to talk to me. They said, Brother Ed, can we talk to you? And I said, sure. So I took them out. I said, let's go over here to the side of the room. We went over to the side of the room and uh, just kind of away from everybody. And uh, I said, what's on your mind? And they said, we need to get saved. They're 16, 15 years old, 15, 16 year old girls. And they said, we need to get saved. How do we get saved? I mean, we, 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 you told us, but we, we want to do that. Yeah. And I had my Bible with me, opened my Bible, and I said, well, let me show you right here. And I showed them the scriptures again, and I said, you guys remember this? Yeah, we remember that. You remember what we're supposed to do? Yeah, and everything that they, they remembered everything that had been taught in church. Yeah. So when it came to a point, I said, well, now you have, to, um, you have to believe, and you have to ask, you have to repent, and you have to ask Christ to come here and be your Savior. Are you ready to do that? And they were like, yes, that's why we, we wanted to talk to you. Mm -hmm. And so that night, I said, well, about, I, I led them to the Lord, bowed their heads, I asked them to pray, they asked Christ to come into their heart, and I was so excited, the other two over there, they got saved too that night, and uh, their, their mom and dad were, were waiting for them outside, we came out of the, uh, out of, we were in the other building at our church, and um, we came out, and the two kids that got saved, they jumped in the car, I could hear them telling their mom and dad, hey, we got saved tonight, they were excited, we got saved tonight, we can't, can we come back, we have an activity on Saturday, can we come back, they were excited to come back to church, and and the parent, and I, said, I heard them as they were driving on. And I had the two girls that were with me, they had come on the bus, and I was taking them home on the church bus. And uh, I said, you know what? I said, before we go, I said, one of the best things you can do once, right after you get saved, is immediately go tell somebody. Because it makes it more real to you. Yeah. Go tell somebody. And they're like, well, who should we tell? I said, how about telling your pastor? I said, well, let's go tell Pastor Quinn. And they're like, okay. So we went over. Pastor Quinn was in his office. We walked in. I knocked on his door. He opened the door. And I said, Pastor, I got a couple young ladies who want to tell you something. And we walked in. And he said, okay. And he, 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 uh, he sits down at his desk. And we sit down on the, that old orange couch that Pastor AJ is fond of talking about. We <laughs> sat down on that orange couch with those two girls. And um, they said, they smiled. And they said, Pastor, we got saved tonight. They were smiling. And Pastor said, that's great. That's, and, and then he asked them a question. And he goes, who, oh, great. Who saved you? Just a quick question. And it was, they got two different answers. The first, the first girl said, Brother Ed. <laughs> the second girl heard her French goes, No, Jesus. And she goes, Oh, yeah, Jesus. <laughs> you know, the ditzy one, right? There's always one of them. And it cracked me up. And she's like, But at least they understood. Yeah. You know, it wasn't me. I led them to the Lord, but it was, God, it was Christ who saved them. And I praise God that they got saved that night. And Pastor Quinn asked them a couple more questions, and they answered them. And they knew that they were going to heaven. And praise God for that. It was a great, it was a great Wednesday night to have those kids get saved. But it's all about bringing kids in. Amen. I pick those girls on the bus. I uh, pick them up on the bus every every week, every Wednesday night for teen class, and, and every Sunday morning for Sunday school for probably a couple, two, three months. And before they finally actually got saved. Amen. I'm glad they were coming. They liked coming to our activities. But but I'm glad that they were able to come and hear the word of God and get saved. That is the shepherd's. Press. He's, he's pressing upon us to go and tell people, amen, in the second verse. Who's going to help? Yeah. Who's going to be the one to bring, us, to bring those people in? And thirdly, tonight I want you guys to look at the shepherd's precept. It's a command that he's given us in this third verse of this same uh, song. Look what he says. This is the command of God. It's a precept that he's given to us to take with us. He says this, out in the desert, hear their cry. Out on the mountains, wild and high. Hark! Tis the master speaks to who? Mm -hmm. Thee. Then he says, go find my sheep, wherever they be. Go out and find them. The precept is to go out and, and find those people, to bring them into the fold. We should be listening to the cry of those who are lost. In Luke chapter number 15, you turn with me there. Luke chapter number 15. And verse number 4. Luke 15 and verse number 4. There's a parable of the Lord and He's teaching and He's, he's talking here. And, and verse number 4 through 7, Luke 15, 4. He says this, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, now we talked about this earlier, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it. And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he... He calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you, this is what Jesus says, I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine just persons who need no repentance. Amen? Just this year, since I come in, in January, 
It was a blessing to see uh, Brother Daniel come to know Christ as Savior. Make sure of it. Amen. Praise God for that, brother. There was rejoicing in heaven on the day that you bowed your head and you asked Christ to be your Savior. There's a party going on in heaven when somebody, when, a, when somebody who needs to be saved bows their head and asks Christ to be their Savior. God is wanting that. And the Bible says there's rejoicing. And there's rejoicing when that happens for, for one sinner that repented. And the precept that God is leaving of us, the command that He's giving us, is that we need to be listening to the cry of those who are lost. We need to be going out and finding them and telling them Jesus is the Master and we need to be following His commands. This precept that He's given us. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse number 9. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse number 9, the Bible says this, And ye masters, do the same things unto them, forbearing threatening. Listen to this, Knowing that your master also is in heaven, neither is there respect of persons with him. Do the same things unto them. Go and do what God has told us to do. Amen. Forbearing and hey, there's going to be opposition. You're going to face a headwind. When you step out in faith to follow God with your life, you're going to be expecting the headwind. You're going to face opposition. And if you don't face opposition, then there's then the devil, there's nothing wrong. Amen. <laughs> the devil's like, go ahead, do what you want. I don't care. Uh, but uh, Brother Brother Harjo, Brother, Brother Bobby Harjo, a good friend of mine who's also with the Lord now, one of the great mentors of mine, great friend of mine. Many times when he would lead somebody to the Lord on the reservation, he was a missionary to the Navajo Indians there. And many times he would lead. I remember I drove him. We took a, a trip, he and I and his boys, and we drove from New Mexico to Oklahoma City uh, to the, uh, to the, uh, the uh, home missions conference there at Southwest Baptist Church and, and Heartland Baptist College there. Uh, several, it was many, many years ago. But we drove back there, and, he, and Brother Harjo, Harjo is from Oklahoma. He has family in Oklahoma, so we didn't have to worry about um, hotel rooms. We stayed with his sister Linda. Sister Linda lived in Oklahoma City or just outside Oklahoma City. So we were able to stay at her house and then go to the, to the, uh, to the conference and everything. But I remember while we were staying there, uh, I believe it was her daughter, uh, uh, I think her name was Santa. And I remember Brother Harjo, we were in the van, we were talking to her, and he started giving her the gospel. And I was driving my car. He was sitting in the back of my car. She was in the car with us. And I was driving. And I could hear him explaining to her about salvation and, and explaining to her that she needed. And I remember that she asked Christ to be. Sitting in the back of my car, I heard her bow her head. And I heard her ask Christ to be her Savior. My good friend, Brother Harjo, led his, I think his niece to the Lord that night. What a blessing it was. But I remember right after he did that, he told her this. And I mean, he said this several times before, but I remember this one's particularly. He said, I want you to know something. Now that you've saved, you've asked Christ to be your Savior, you've put a target on your back. He told her that. He said, I'm not trying to scare you. He said, but if you are serious about what you just did, there's a target on your back because the devil does not like what you just did. And the devil's going to come after you and the devil's going to uh, uh, oppress you and he's going to... Give, he's going to do everything he can to discourage you and get you away from God. Get you mad at the church. Get you mad at the preacher. Get you far away so that you can go astray. But he said, don't let it happen. You stay close to God. You stay following God. You keep reading your Bible. You keep praying. You keep coming to church. Regardless of what happens, you be in church. You, you, you uh, do what you can to stay close to the Lord. Amen. We're to be focusing on His commands. The Bible says there, that we are going to be for, we're going to forbear, we're going to have to forbear threatening as we go forward. But then in the next few verses, it tells us to put on that armor of God. Amen. To put on that whole armor of God and go forward in the power of God's might with praying and, and, and some prayers and supplications. We're supposed to do that. So one of his commands is to seek the sheep by proclaiming the gospel. We know that Mark 16, 15, we're supposed to go and tell the whole world. Amen. And so, this, this, this song, Bring Them In, is such a great song because there's simple three things there. Number one, the first verse, it talks about the shepherd's purpose. Number two, the second verse talks about the shepherd's press, his constraining us, his command to us, and what we're supposed to do. And then the third one is the shepherd's precept, his command to us, what we're supposed to uh, take with us and do every single day. Now I want you to look at the chorus of this song. The chorus of this song goes on to this. Bring them in, bring them in. Bring them in from the fields of sin. And he goes on and repeats it. Bring them in. Bring them in. Bring the wandering ones to Jesus. Amen. Bring the wandering ones to Jesus. 
We're supposed to be going out and telling people about Christ. Have you passed out your five tracks this week since Sunday? If you're not there, I, I've, I've gotten two out. I need to get more out. I was telling Pastor the other day uh, when Brother Caleb and I uh, were, were uh, really, remember Brother Caleb was here last week, and uh, or was it last week, two weeks ago, whenever it was, I remember when he was, we had the, we had the youth, youth rally. Brother Caleb, uh, you know, uh, Brother Caleb's a big guy, you know, six, six, whatever he is, big guy. And, uh, and uh, but he wanted, he said, is there, a, is there a big and tall store? I said, yes, there's one, right? I know where it is, it's one I shop at. And we went over there, and it was way over here in uh, Linwood, I think it was Linwood or in Eaglewood, over there somewhere. Um, it was off Eaglewood. Anyway, we, I drove him down there. We went in and we're, he's wandering around looking at the place. I wasn't really looking. I had any money, but I drove him there. Amen. So he's in there kind of looking for some shirts that he wants to get. And I start talking to the lady that works there, the cashier. And uh, she, she said, uh, we can order it for you. She, so she said, if you need anything, we can order it. I said, well, I said, he's only here uh, for a short time. I said, uh, he's actually from Arkansas. And she goes, oh, you're not from here. I said, yeah, he's from Arkansas. I said, I, I'm staying in Gardena. I said, but I'm actually from New Mexico. I said, but I'm, I'm going to be leaving too shortly. I said, in, a few weeks, in about a month or so, I told her, I'm going to be going to Wisconsin to help another church. I said, I'm, going to, I'm, I'm helping churches wherever I can. And, and, and uh, I said, are you from here? And she goes, oh, no, no. I live in Bellflower. I said, really? And so I got a track, and I handed it to her. And I said, here, I said, I don't know where you live in Bellflower, but I want to tell you, I'm helping a church in Bellflower right now. And it's Solid Rock Baptist Tabernacle. Here's the information on there. And in there, there's a, there, if, you, if you have any questions about your eternity, there was the, the people coming into the store, and I didn't want to take her time. She was the only cashier there. But I handed her a track, and I wanted her to understand that, the, that if she ever wanted to come and visit our church, that we were here. I said, we're right off of Bellflower Boulevard. Every Sunday and Thursday night, you can come anytime you want to show up. I also told her we always have a meal. There's always some food there if you want to come. I said, you sure be welcome to come. And so, you know, I prayed for her, but, you know, these are the, the opportunities that we have. I'm over there several uh, couple, several cities away, and she says, oh, I work here, but I live in Bellflower. I was like, well, I know what church in Bellflower, amen? Right? Yeah. And praise God for that. But we're supposed, to go out, we're supposed to go out and bring them in. The Bible says that we're supposed to go and help the Lord seek those lost and bring them into the fold, amen? So let me encourage you this week. There's a few days left before Sunday, amen? How can, what can we do in the next few days? To encourage and, and, and give the gospel out and hand a track to somebody and share the gospel with somebody. What can we do in the next few days to help the shepherd's purpose? Amen. That's what I want to share with you guys tonight and encourage you to do so. Let's go ahead and we'll uh, have a time of prayer tonight. We'll close in prayer. I want to thank you guys for listening tonight and uh, just remember these simple things that we learned about bringing them in. Amen. Praise God. Thanks, Facebook. We'll see you guys.